In a recent video I started showing this. It is a microcontroller. It's a very old uh, device. It was designed back in the 70s and it's an ATX300. And uh, for anyone that's not familiar with these, they are the direct uh, ancestor of the PIC microcontroller. And this is really um, what the PIC microcontroller core was originally developed from. It's a very interesting processor. It's um, extremely reliable. It's quite powerful for its age. It runs at uh, up to 8 megahertz, but it's got uh, quite a small instruction set. And uh, what I was going to use this for was to demonstrate how to uh, use a logic analyzer to design systems. So, as I say, it's quite an interesting device, but um, in order to make it do anything, I need to hook it up to a ROM. And um, it's a 16-bit wide uh, data access for the ROM. And uh, you could use, for example, two 8-bit ROMs or any combination of ROMs. But what I intend to do is use one of these, which is a 27C400. And I'm using this because it's got uh, a 16-bit wide data bus. So it's quite um, easy to interface with this. I, I can just connect the two uh, pretty much directly together. Um, but of course I need some code to actually run. Now when I started this project I was just going to um, cobble together some uh, very simple code from the uh, data sheet. It's got quite a simple instruction set but there are some complications to it because of the uh, multiple ways that certain or nearly all the instructions can be used. And uh, so what I decided to do because I'll probably be doing quite a few experiments with this once it's all up and running. Uh, so I decided to write an assembler for it, just to make life a lot easier. And some of the programs I'm going to write will be fairly complicated anyway, so um, coding them by hand is a, a real pain uh, where you have to manually calculate addresses and that sort of thing. Um, so I wouldn't normally show it, but I've been asked in the past to show more detail. So I'm just going to take a quick look in this video at the progress I've made so far on the assembler. I've only spent five or six hours on it uh, so far. Um, if you're not interested in this sort of thing then just skip this video. Uh, but uh, as I said I've been asked to show a bit more detail on some of the kind of background tasks and um, over the last 20 years I've probably written 25 different assemblers and uh, so I thought I'd show this one because they are quite interesting pieces of software and also it gives you quite a good insight into the uh, processor that you're actually dealing with. Now I stress here that what we'll be looking at is an assembler, not a compiler, and the real difference is an assembler takes the machine instructions pretty much as they are laid out in the data sheet and it turns those into object code that can be uh, in theory put straight into uh, a ROM, but normally if you're using a compiler they'll be taken into the compiler and the compiler will then bring together one or more of those object files to produce the final code that is put into the ROM. And the real benefit of a compiler is it adds a layer of uh, human readable uh, language to the uh, instructions so you don't need to know the inner workings uh, of the processor to write the code as you do with machine language and uh, they vary quite a bit but you'll get fairly standard languages such as C or C++ and uh, that's a high level language that simplifies the programming operation and then you can use a cross compiler to compile code for specific target hardware. Um, but I'm not going to write a compiler, I'm just going to limit um, this to an assembler. And. Uh, as I say, I thought we'd have a quick look at this, so we'll go over to the PC and uh, see how far I've got with it so far. Okay, so for this project I decided to use Ball and & Builder, and I'm using the C++ option uh, within it. So I wanted an assembler that had a graphical interface rather than it being command line. It's very straightforward, very simple assembler. Uh, there are some complications because of the way the instruction set for this particular processor works, um, but it is quite an interesting processor, so um, I thought some people might find the assembler interesting. It does give some insight into the way that the processor works. 
and uh, also it uh, might give some insight into the way that uh, microchip picks work as well because they do work in a fairly similar manner as far as the uh, core is concerned. Okay, so yeah, as you can see, it's a very simple window. It's just got three panes, um, one on the left to type in the project code, one in the center that will show any symbols that are found when the code is assembled, and um, one on the right that shows the output values. Um, although it's not a compiler, uh, I will be using symbols. I wanted to be able to use labels for um, destination addresses for jump instructions and so what I've done is I've written it in such a way that you can either type in a hex um, address for the destination or a label and uh, we'll come back to that in a few minutes it, it's just that it makes it far easier rather than having to calculate addresses um, but it does mean that um, the assembler has to be a two-pass assembler um, because it has to go through first and uh, find the labels so if we look at the code um, I start this, uh, normally this would be in separate files. Um, I've put everything into one file here just to make this video easy to uh, produce. Um, but uh, you'd normally put these into separate data files. Um, but what we've got here is uh, a series of structures and each of these structures and their uh, following uh, structure arrays are the uh, effectively the list of legal values for each of the fields that comprise the instruction set. So there's one of these for each of the possible fields that can be in an instruction and in this particular processor the instructions can have anything from one to four fields. So there's, uh, as I say, these are all the possible uh, values that are for each of the possible uh, strings that can be typed in for each instruction. We've then got a bit of housekeeping here that allows us to load and save files uh, for our project. So when we write some source code of course we want to save it and there's also a bit of logic in here that checks if the, um, the file's been changed. If you try to close it or open another, another file it will ask you if you want to save it just like a polite software rather than just uh, closing software and uh, or closing the file and you're losing all the work that you've done. Uh, and then we get down to the interesting bit. This is when you click on the assemble button. We start off by uh, just initializing some values. We clear and uh, put some headers into the text boxes. And as I said, it's a two pass um, assembly process that I've got here. So the first pass is to build the symbol table. And in this case, the symbol table is just the list of labels that are being used. Um, but we can't just list the labels by line number um, because the lines that are in the source code will not be the same as the uh, number of lines or the addresses in the output code. It could be, but it's uh, unlikely that it will be. Uh, so the code has to go through and scan to identify any valid uh, opcodes and it then can figure out the address of any labels it then finds. And it has to be able to identify the difference between a label and opcode and uh, the various fields and comments. So it scans through and it does that. You can see it's a fairly efficient piece of code. There's, it's only about 100 uh, lines, uh, although there are some helper functions. Uh, which we'll look at later. And if I just run through the code uh, up to this point, so just run through the uh, first pass of the code, and I'll load a test file, and we'll click on assemble. So it's now run through, you see it's fairly fast. If we go up and look at the symbol array, you can see that it has now identified and saved four labels and that's how many labels are in this source code. And it's also saved the correct addresses. These numbers on the right are the uh, opcode address, not the line number but the opcode address for the particular instruction. Okay so we'll reset the program. We then go on to the second pass which is when the real fun starts. This is where it um, identifies the opcodes and it uh, compiles them or assembles them into um, 
machine code numbers in a binary format that it can output to a file that can then be programmed into a ROM. So the way this works is it again has to deal with uh, labels and comments. So the comments can be either on their own line or they can follow a label or instruction. So the software has to be smart enough to be able to figure the difference. Uh, and also I've built in quite a lot of error checking as well. So if you type in the wrong number of characters for a particular field or it doesn't, so it's not a valid character or valid opcode, it, um, it will flag it up. So it uh, runs through looking for up to um, four uh, fields, that's the opcode and three, up to three arguments, any more than that and it's an error, so it will flag that up. And then it gets down to this point for each line, and this is a switch based on the uh, opcode that's been identified. And it will then jump to one of several handlers. Because of the way the um, processor instruction set is organized in this processor, uh, some of the handlers can be common. The only thing that's different is the uh, opcode itself. And so it jumps through to the various handlers, which are in separate functions. So this is one, for example. You see it's fairly compact. And all this is doing is looking through the um, various uh, options that are available for that particular field in the instruction. And it's figuring out as long as it's a valid instruction, it's figuring out if uh, or what the numeric value should be for that field. Uh, and then it shifts it into the correct location. So in this in, uh, instruction set, all the instructions are 16-bit instructions, um, but each of the fields, of course, occupies um, one uh, kind of uh, part or, or bit set of that uh, overall instruction. And so the numeric value for a particular part of the instruction is shifted into the correct location. And there are a few of these. So for example, we pass the uh, move instruction in various steps. So it checks the S field, the RL field and the D field separately, figures out the various um, numeric values for those fields and shifts them into the correct location. And then it merges them in the um, uh, individual handlers. So if we look at another handler, for example, this one is to check the S field. And again, it shifts it into the correct location for the S field. And there's another one for the RL, another one for D. And uh, there are some other helper functions for clearing arrays and uh, converting to various bases. So you find it quicker uh, if you're writing something like this just to write your own conversion routines. It's far quicker. This will take literally three or four minutes to write something like this. And you could easily spend an hour trying to find something online to do the same thing. So it's just far easier. This particular one takes uh, an integer value and uh, generates a six digit uh, octal string from it. And then the one at the bottom uh, generates a 16 bit binary string from a, uh, an integer. Okay, so if we go back up, uh, we also have handlers for things like the jump, which is a bit more complex because it has to figure out if it's using a label uh, or a hex uh, value. If it's a label, it has to look up the label and then extract the label address from the table that was generated in pass one of the assembly process. And once it's done that, it outputs everything to uh, output uh, windows. And so if we now run the code, I'll reload the test file, click on assemble, and you can see it's fairly fast. It's now assembled this, it's found the four labels that are in the source code, and then it's output this as well as into a binary file. It outputs it here so we can review it. So we've got the hex address, and the hex value for the instruction, the octal value for the instruction, and the binary value for the instruction. Um, one of the complications in writing something like this is the ambiguity in um, the way people enter text into uh, text boxes, text windows, text editors. Uh, so for example, I wanted to be able to use 
uppercase or lowercase and not have to try and remember which it is if I come back to this in several years uh, to reuse it I didn't want to have to try and figure out whether it was supposed to be uppercase or lowercase so it can handle any if I change it to lowercase and click on assemble you can see it assembles the same way uh, you can see here it's showing the address for each of the labels if we were to change this and put another um, instruction in the source code then the addresses would all change so if we put another instruction here so you can see that the labels aren't the same for any labels that appear after this point in the code so in other words it will figure out uh, exactly where all the addresses should be or you can as we've got down here enter a value in uh, directly in hex so we can see here that it compiles into the correct value um, so if we change this to a different value so we'll change the uh, a to a b reassemble and we can see here that the new address or the new um, uh, instruction has been uh, generated so this is uh, essentially how it works it, uh, there is already some uh, fairly in-depth error checking so if we type in an invalid instruction it will throw up an invalid instruction error or we can use uppercase or lowercase if we try and jump to a, uh, a label that doesn't exist again it will say, uh, tell us this so it's same label not found so it is quite uh, uh, smart already in terms of the error checking I've got a lot more work to do on this yet but um, thought that some of you might be interested in seeing the inner workings of this if you want to see more of this or more detail then leave a comment um, if not then I'll just uh, use this to generate the code that we'll be running in our project